Good morning, everybody. We're going to start right now, if you don't mind, if you're able to stand. Uh, you know, we mean that from a physical standpoint. We know some folks just can't do it. We, uh, we understand that. We don't want any protests not standing. But we're glad that we can be together this morning. There's a lot of things that uh, are difficult, a lot of things that are troubles and trials, but there's also a lot of blessings. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this fact this week, the contrast you see. And sometimes you have a tendency to overlook the good parts and the, and the blessing parts because the other parts are indeed heavy and, you know, but they, like the song says, the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. Can you say amen? amen? All right, let's ask God to help us this morning to give strength to everyone. Thank you for being here and those that are joining us by way of the so-called social media. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm, 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 oh, you know, we had like, like 300... Give you an example, like last week, the last time I checked was a few days ago, over 300 people, up to 300 people, at least, I don't know how long they watched, but they, they were in part of the service at some point during the week, last Sunday morning service, over 300. And, and, and that doesn't give you a, a total of, of, of really everybody to see something. So the word of God goes out and we're glad. Can you say amen? amen? Father, we thank you for your word, for your power, for your grace. As we read this morning, my wife and I in, in the book of Isaiah, you said that if we would wait on the Lord, we would renew our strength. So we wait on you today for, to have our strength renewed. We can mount up with eagles, like wings like eagles, and run and not be weary and walk and not be afraid. Help us, Lord, to depend on you and to have confidence that you uh, today and in the days to come. And help those that need a touch today, people that are afflicted. Well, perhaps why some aren't with us this morning. You know the needs. You know the problems. You're the God all the way around this entire earth, Lord. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. amen. All right, this is a statement. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I'm like a tree planted by the water. But I shall not be moved. Well, I shall not be, I shall not be moved.
tell that there was somebody at the door in the back, and you know, you never know when it's the piano player. So I went over and somebody, it, it got locked by accident, and I opened it up. He, I said, man, I would never lock anybody out of church, especially, the, I mean, not that we don't love all of you, but especially the piano player, but uh, wouldn't want to lock anybody out. Everybody's not coming to church. I don't know if you know that or not. There's some people who just can't come. Oh, I, I don't know if I ought to do this or not. And I might get it wrong, too. So some people can't come. Some people don't want to come. Some people know they should come. I see, see why I didn't want to get that started. But, you know, if anybody, and this, this one, I don't, I don't think we want to make excuses, but there are explanations. If anybody thinks that times are normal, whatever that means. Let's say, let's don't say normal. Let's say like three years ago. It, that's not true. But then again, maybe we were living under a delusion. What, what, what did the Bible tell us about times and seasons? And, and people have, you know, Scott and I were talking about uh, how that, that, that America, if you, if you stop at the Civil War, and don't, I don't think, I don't know for a moment how much we've been touched by the horror of the world. We've lost lots of lives because of world wars and things, but we weren't touched by it. In any war uh, since the Civil War, like uh, some other parts of the world have been, you know, and, and that that's just to say that the world is acquainted with trouble. And, I, and then I and then I thought, well, maybe that's why America hasn't learned some lessons. But I, but I don't know that Europe has learned any lessons. And, and when, when we say America or Europe, we're not talking about everybody. We're talking about people. But 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 these are troubled times. Always, the Bible says that they're troubled times. The Bible in the New Testament emphasizes the apostles taught that we are living then. They taught the church they're living in the last days and that continues until it's all over. But, but the Lord's going to end it all someday and that's why we're, we're doing some of this preaching in, in Bible prophecy. Not my, not my prophecy, not man's prophecy, but what God says. And we've gone through these minor, we went through the major prophets, just some highlights, we certainly didn't preach them verse by verse. And we're going through the minor prophets, and uh, now we're in Daniel, and we want, we want to try to understand the structure of the world. And the way God's put the world together, allowed the world, he didn't put it together like this, but he's, but he's what, what did God do? Did he say, let's just do away with it? No, he saved it. He, he provided salvation. I've come that you might have life. Explain to a Jewish teacher one night, Jesus said, God so loved the world, that just as simple and plain as it could be, God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. And sometimes when I think about our problems and our difficulties, I hear Jesus saying, well, I don't understand what that's like. You know? And you know, it, it, you can say, well, that's the way it had to be. But that's not really quite true. Jesus did that because he wanted to, because he chose to. Not my will, but thine be done. That, hey, that might be a neat way to pray today. Just all of a sudden say, you know what? I don't really have a will anymore. Not that you don't, and that, that it's bad, but I just want the will of God done. Why wouldn't you want the will of God done? And then like we, we, we saw in the, in the Bible study by, by, uh, a, week, a week ago, uh, in the book of Romans, uh, talking about faith and, and how the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that we can't other. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray for sometimes. I don't mean we don't know how to pray, but we don't know what the issue really is. Like God says, go ahead and ask what, well, what are we sure what to ask what the Holy Spirit knows. He, he, he reads us and reads the mind of, the, of, of, of God himself. Aren't you glad? Isn't that a wonderful thing? And we think about what Jesus has done for us. That's one of the reasons why uh, we have this time of communion. It came on just a little bit quicker than you, you might have thought because we, we had to postpone it for a week. So we've had a great time and we, we had a wonderful time last week and my granddaughter was baptized and we had a great service and we appreciate those who were here and those that have joined in and people that made different comments it's a wonderful thing to serve the lord it's a wonderful thing uh, to have family and friends and people that you've known and uh, you know when you get into god it transcends families the bloodline doesn't it you can just form relationships and boy it's the family of god isn't that a wonderful thing the family of god I don't, I don't uh, profess to know everything. Uh, there's no future in that. <laughs> but I do know that God knows. And like I said earlier, he doesn't slumber. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't get weary. He's not in doubt. He's not unsure. He's never weak. 
There is nothing. God is nothing but total strength and wisdom and knowledge. And he's made that unto us, the Apostle Paul said. Aren't you glad? Praise his name. Well, God, God is, is worthy of our love. God is worthy of our praise. And uh, we, we appreciate the way the Lord has been with us. Now, uh, I know I do know that there are people on the way and they've had some problems and I will, I will say this, we don't, we don't want to cover for everybody. It's not our place to explain why they're not here, but the, one of the most unusual explanations for why you're not getting to church, Joe, was from Carol this morning. She said that the police have her whole place locked down because there's a person found in the canal in the back by the golf course. And so she can't get out of her complex. So if she can get out, we pray that she'll be able to drive safely and that the Lord will take care of all that. You know, I can, I can understand that. Uh, we, came, we came back from the church yesterday, my wife and I, in Oakland Park. They routed, every, can you believe they routed every westbound car past Powell? I didn't see any signs. Maybe there were some signs. They routed us on to 95 going south. I had to go back to Sunrise, where I just come from right over here. And they're, working, they're doing something on the railroad tracks. The whole thing shut down, lock, stock, and barrel. Not by, by an accident, but there's all kinds of working equipment and everything. So you never know. And we almost forgot about it this morning. And just as I was getting at the 441, I said, whoops, we've got to make a right and go down to Sunrise. Because you can't get across. If anybody uses local park, just forget about that right now. That's the railroad. Did you have, have a problem with that? No, you didn't come that way. By 95, you know. And the local park right in there. So but I was just glad. It, I, I first thought, oh, no, Lord, it was a terrible accident. But thank God there wasn't an accident. And we hate to see that. Hear about people with problems and difficulties. But... God's with us, and if God be with us and for us, who can be against us, the Bible says? Greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. So let's, let's receive the offering this morning. God bless you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your love and your mercy and your kindness to the work of God. And uh, a lot of people need the Lord to uh, be able to get through to their hearts and to stir them up and to touch their minds and hearts today. A lot of the saints of God. I, I've, never, I've never seen, there's a lot of good things happening, but I've never seen so many discouraged Christians and you, you, know, you, have, you have contact with people on Facebook. I'm talking about mostly people don't even know. And ministers. And, uh, and right away, you know, when things change because of circumstances, uh, you know, I can understand this. I've, I've experienced this. I do experience it. Sometimes the pastor right away says, it must be me. There's something wrong with me. And it's good to think that and examine it. But folks, you can't carry everybody's failure on your shoulders. And neither can I. Everybody's lack of commitment. And their way they deal with things. You, you just can't take responsibility for it. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Can you say amen? Amen. Terry Bray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful once again to be in your house today, Lord. And Lord, for all those people that are not here, for whatever reason, Lord, we just need yes, know that you have your hand upon them and give them whatever mercy they have yes, need to you, be Jesus. here and be part of your church and your will and your work, Lord. And Lord, for all those people that are here, Lord, we just ask you to bless each person here. Put Just give them your peace and grace yes, Jesus. and love that we don't deserve, but you said that you would give it to us abundantly, Lord. And we just ask you to just help each person with whatever needs we may have, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to keep each person in yes, your Jesus. care and as we go through this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you very much. We appreciate that. That's great music and a great song. And it's true, if you know the words, I think you do. We, uh, we took a little ride earlier this week to say a final goodbye to my son and his wife and, and the grandkids. And uh, we were up in the Orlando area and we, we were by, uh, everybody says they were by Disney, but we weren't by Disney, we were by Universal Studios, but we weren't, weren't in any parks. Those days, I told Scott, those days are gone forever, man, I don't want to go in any amusement parks and walk around. But uh, just a few fringe areas and... Uh, but before, before I left, my, my son was watching a guy who tells you, you know, what to do when you go to those places. There's, there's a guy that, and his wife that does Disney and a guy and his wife that does uh, Universal. They make a lot of money giving these walking tours and followers on YouTube Live. And he had an interesting thing I saw the other day. He said, six things you're not allowed to do in the, in the amusement park. And I thought, I wonder what they are. And then he said at the end, he was going to tell you the one thing you can do this for sure going to get you kicked out of the park. And I didn't realize it would connect to church, you know, like don't, we, don't, we don't want you to be uh, universal. I don't guess anybody likes this when they're selling food. Don't bring picnic lunches. So I guess you shouldn't bring a picnic lunch to church unless you're going to bring it to the back and we're all going to eat it. I'll tell you what, if you bring a picnic lunch around here, somebody's going to probably <laughs> want to see what you got and eat it. And all kinds of things that just make common sense, things you just don't want to do because it's just simply impolite and it, gets on the road of other people. But I was interested, what, what would it be that would get you thrown out of the park for sure? And they have one particular boat ride that goes down like a, a rough area and hits the bottom and they said, people actually jump out of the boat. They said, that'll just get you removed from the park. And I thought, you know, jumping out of the boat's not a good idea, unless the boat's on fire or something. It's like the guy that said he had never used the parachute because he never could see a reason to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Don't jump out of the boat. Unless, of course, you know, it's, it's like I say, doomed and it's the wrong boat and it's going in the wrong direction, perhaps. But even then, sometimes you have to be spiritual about it. But assuming we're on the boat of salvation and Jesus is the pilot, he'll pilot me. Remember that old gospel song? Through life's tempestuous sea. He'll pilot me. Don't jump out of the boat. See? Nebuchadnezzar was all upset about this dream he had. He couldn't remember. He wanted to know what it meant, but he couldn't even remember it. And uh, he knew his wise men were a bunch of con men. Wise men were con men. How, why would you have them if you knew they were con men? He'd already found out that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were ten times better than all the others, but he didn't even think about them. He said, just kill everybody. They're going to come and make up some phony story. And Daniel said, hold on. Hold on. Don't be so hasty. Don't jump out of the boat. Haste makes waste. The Bible does have a verse in it that says that... Uh, you should move with speed and expediency and sometimes get in a hurry, but it also says, he that believeth shall not make haste. You have to go according to the, you know, that business. That, it's a neat thing, but you don't walk according to your own metronome. Like, you know, don't walk to other, no, you walk to God's beat. If God's one, two, three, four, that's what you do. If God's one, two, three, four, that's what you do. See. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, it says in chapter 2, his spirit was troubled because he had dreamed dreams and his sleep left him and he called the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans to tell him his dreams. So they came and they stood before him to tell the king about his dreams. And he said, well, I've dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Well, no problem. See, The Chaldeans said, uh, tell us the dream, and we'll tell you the interpretation. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not interested in Zorak, Karnak the Magnificent, or some enchantress, enchanter, some interpreter dreams, fortune teller. I get, I, 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 I Maybe, maybe people say this is too radical, but when I drive down the road and I see a, a place where they advertise a fortune teller and tarot cards and all that, I get sick of my stomach. I don't want, I don't want to hear somebody 
like that because they don't know what they're talking about. They don't have any evidence that they know what anything means. God has evidence that he knows what things mean. God's people have evidence as long as they stick to the word of God and what God really says to know what it means. He said, well, listen, the thing is gone from me. And if you don't make it known to me, I'm going to cut you in pieces and I'm going to destroy your houses. But if you tell me the dream and the interpretation, you will have great honor. Show me the dream and the interpretation. And they said to the king again, tell us the dream and we'll show you the interpretation. Now, see, he knew these people. Now, like I say, why does he keep them employed? Why does he have them on the, on the payroll? He said, I knew for certain that you would want to gain some time, you know, give up your responsibility because it's gone from me. But let me tell you the way I look at it. If you don't make me know what I dreamed, there's only one decree for you because I know you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. See, If you can tell me the dream, I shall know that you can show me the interpretation. Listen to this. I want you to know that anybody can be wrong and, and wise men can be wrong. Counselors can be wrong. Judge things by the Holy Spirit. Judge things by the Spirit of God. Don't just take everybody's word for it. He says, or they said, excuse me, the Chaldeans, and listen to what they said. Listen to what they said. There is not a man on earth that can take care of this. And there is no other king or lord or ruler that asks such a thing. It's a rare thing. It's a strange thing that you require. And there's nobody that can show you. Oh, except the gods, uh, you know, some supernatural power can show you. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, they said something right. Yeah, they, they weren't thinking of, of Jehovah or God Almighty, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Daniel. But oh, some, some, some supernatural power. I was, I was wondering where, if they, if they didn't know that much about supernatural power, where were they going to get the interpretation? They didn't even cover themselves. They said it would take the power of a God to know the dream, and then, of course, I guess, to give the interpretation. Where were they going to, where were they going to get the interpretation? They said, uh, uh, they said a, God, a God could give the dream. Well, where were they? And, and so they weren't going to get the dream, so they weren't in tune with the God. So where were they going to get the interpretation? Just like he said, they were going to make it up. Seems to me, everybody's got advice. Sometimes it's not malicious, but it's not good. It's not right. It doesn't even matter if it seems like it's not wrong. If it's not God, it's not right. God, God speaks to us sometimes in ways that are difficult to understand. He told the Apostle Paul not to go into Bithynia. And, and like I've preached many times, we think the next thing that happened is that he saw the man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. But God didn't give him that right away. He just told him not to go to Bethany, but he didn't tell him where to go. So Paul took it easy and just waited. Like Daniel said, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. The king was angry, he was furious, he commanded to destroy the wise men. The decree went forth that all the wise men would be slain and they even looked for Daniel and his friends. And Daniel said, why is the decree so hasty from the king? The captain told him, and Daniel went in and desired of the king. He went to see Nebuchadnezzar and said, Give me a break. I'm not part of this. I'm a Hebrew. I didn't ask to be brought over here. No, he didn't say that. He said, Give me some time. And he said, I will show you the interpretation. Now, now he wasn't being presumptuous. You, everybody's not going to be, be able to speak for God, even if they're God's men and women. You know, God, everybody's not going to speak for God at a certain time. God uses different people in different ways. And, and God's uh, spirit, spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit in the New Testament, they're not, they're not necessarily revelatory. They're not here to tell us the future. But Daniel, because of what's happening to him, because of the way he's dealing with God in this new strange situation, knows that God is using him like this and knows that God, God has assured him that he's going to give, God has already told him that he's going to give him the interpretation, or he wouldn't say that. But that he did, what, what I want to emphasize more than the interpretation of the dream, and, I, and, we, and you know what, we might not even get to that 
where we, we can talk about all that. We, I don't know how far we're going to get because we have communion this morning. But I want you to know that Daniel and his partners, they were a lot of things. But they were humble. They weren't presumptuous. They weren't arrogant. Even though they had already been declared ten times better than the other counselors, it didn't do them any good. They said, we're going to die with, they were going to kill us just as quickly as the other people. Let me tell you something, when somebody gives you a compliment, they can kill you later. Maybe not always intentionally. You, that just doesn't mean anything. You say, well, you, you, no, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say it means a little something. Because if you start to make something out of it, it's going to get you in a, into a problem. What they say might be true. Somebody gives you some instructions about you and about your life and how good you are and what your talent is, and it's true, you think it's true, and it makes you feel good. What are you going to do when somebody says the opposite? Are you going to feel bad because they said it? In other words, the confidence doesn't come because of what they said or didn't say. It doesn't mean it's not okay for them to say it, and you can say, thank you very much, I appreciate that, and go your way. But if you build on the report of the captain or the counselors or the Chaldeans or Nebuchadnezzar, if you build on that, you're going to be disappointed. Because no matter what you do, and you might know what God wants you to do, and you might know that God's with you and what God has said, but you still have to desire mercy like it says. They would desire mercy. God said, let's go and desire mercy of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Let's go and desire mercy of God. Let's come before God and desire mercy. That goes against that arrogant telling God the way it's going to be. The hyper-faith movement said, you tell God what to do. You're in charge. God's giving you his authority. No, he hasn't. God has given you authority as a believer, but not his authority. What are you supposed to do then with the verses they were supposed to bow before him, break before him, bend low before him, cast ourselves on him? If you're Jesus, if you are Jesus, bid me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come on. And he did. And then he began to drown after walking for a little while. But what did he do? He said, so much for this Jesus business. He must not be Jesus. No, he didn't analyze what was wrong. He just said, Jesus, save me. I'm going to drown. People would learn how to pray in desperation. Their prayers would be more effective. Amen? So you thought I was going to go into this book of Daniel and give you all these strange visions and God's interpretations and who the Persians are and who the Greeks are and who the Romans are. And all that. I'm, going, I'm going to probably say something about that. But listen, folks, this is filled with advice for how Christians are supposed to operate under less than ideal circumstances. He's a long ways from home, Daniel is. And he's never going back. God, you took me from my home. My family was righteous. We weren't the people that disobeyed you. We weren't the people that didn't listen to the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. We did listen. Why am I here? Take me back, Lord. Take me back. I want to go home. Here's what I want. You know what's wrong with a lot of people's prayer time? They spend too much time praying for Melissa. It says, here's 10 things I want God to do for me and I want him to do it soon. Sometimes God's not going to do certain things because he's not going to let it happen. He's not going to take you back home sometimes. You are where you are. You are where you are. You're a child of God. Wake up. Snap out of it. And you're not here for yourself. You're here for somebody else. So after all of this humility and all of this praying and all of this interpreting things properly, it says the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven in verse 19. And he said in verse 20, look at this great prayer that he prays. He didn't just say, okay, boys, I got it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's hurry. No, no. We're going to take time to praise God. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. Here, 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 here's your words of great prophecy and understanding and and, and, and the way things are. Here's your apocalyptic information. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings. I had, a, I had a friend who went on a business trip to some place. I don't know if it was in Illinois or Indiana, but it was some area where they don't all follow the daylight saving time. I, I know there's an entire state, like Arizona, that don't do it, but there's certain sections of the country, you know, that say, we're not going to do it. So there was, a, there was one area where on one side of town, it, it, they were doing the daylight saving time, and on the other side, they weren't. And he said, do you know what that means? And I said, well, I think I do. And he said, no, you really don't know what that means. He said, he said that means you can eat lunch twice. <laughs> it's 12 o'clock and we'll eat. And then, oh, it's 12 o'clock again over there. You know, well, okay. 
God, God don't change his times and seasons. And time's a real problem, isn't it? Everybody tells me they feel like time's going faster. Maybe you don't feel that way, but most people say it's going faster. It's not really. But do you know times are, are not, not something to depend on because it's temporary. The, the, it says in the book of Revelation, talking about prophecy, that an angel is going to step out one day and declare that time shall be no more. And until then, my times are in his hands, the man of God said. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. I thank thee and praise you, God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of you. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Do you know and understand that Daniel knew what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and even he didn't know right now what he dreamed? It's that dream of the image. And then he, of course, went out and made an image like that and, 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 and asked people to worship it. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was a slow learner. Now, if you've read the book of Daniel before, he's going to learn. He's going to be broken by God. God's going to, for a man who couldn't remember a dream, God's going to drive him into insanity for seven years. Did you know that? This great, magnificent, king of the world is going to go insane for seven years and he's going to come to God. And they're going to find him one day. I'm not talking about the man in the Gadarenes and people in the New Testament. I'm talking about Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to find him sitting with his clothes on properly and in his right mind and he's giving credit to God. And unless something went very, very wrong, uh, it seems that Nebuchadnezzar is in eternity waiting for the saints of God. And he, came, he, he understood what Daniel said. But he didn't know. What you don't know, you don't know, but it doesn't matter if God knows it. God gave it to Nebuchadnezzar, not so Nebuchadnezzar could have a dream or so that he could forget the dream. He wanted him to forget the dream so that he could ask for help and he could have Daniel interpret it so he could give a message to Nebuchadnezzar and everybody else as to what he's going to do. Not in Babylon today or tomorrow, but in the world in the days to come until the very end when Jesus comes. And this is the exact same kind of revelation. It's given in different format, but it's the same revelation that was given to Daniel that we did talk about when we made the transition from Habakkuk over to Daniel about the animals and, and them representing the kingdoms and what's going to happen in the world. Somebody said, why would God give the revelation twice? Well, that's not the point. The point is, it's the same revelation every time. God doesn't give a different revelation, a different interpretation to the same revelation. It's what he says today. It'll be what he says tomorrow. I am the Lord. I don't change and I don't lie and I'm not mistaken. And he said, I want you to know basically, let me do this because I, I know we're not going to be able to, to do what I want to to give this uh, the proper attention. And, and if Jesus tarries and we're all here and we can come back again. And for those that are listening to us in other ways, we're going we're gonna to preach it, the Lord willing. But let me say basically that what God wants these people to know is that God is not wrapping things up by removing the Babylonian Empire. A lot of people thought if he could get rid of the Babylonian Empire, a lot of the Jews that had been taken captive would have said, just get rid of these Babylonians and everything will be all right. Will it? Will it, will it be all right? No. Because there's another empire going to come. And it's going to be greater, mightier, stronger, more dangerous. And let me tell you that every time it comes, it doesn't get better. That doesn't mean in the midst of all of these things, God doesn't do good things and use even some aspects. Like, for instance, when Rome gets here, that's, that's the last one that he sees from which all the others come into modern times. The Romans gave us some good things. Somebody made a statement to the effect that somewhere in France there's a road that the Romans built is still good and one that the Parisians built two weeks ago that's already broken up. Well, I understand all that. I don't think you're going to drive your car 70 miles an hour over the ones, on ones the Romans, but, but they, you know, you know, people's money systems and roads and architectures and, and the Romans actually found out how to pour concrete underwater and make it last you know, which is not an easy thing to do the last thing a guy pouring concrete wants to see is rain can you imagine doing it underwater but they did but so what but I'm saying it's all bad even for the good part it's bad because it's in the wrong direction so here comes the, the next the next power and the next power and the next power and, and God said he's going to keep on and keep on and keep on. And Jesus said, yes, that's the way it is in Matthew 24. And there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. 
and the whole world system. And even though America is going to provide, when you're trying to find a parking place, and even though America is going to give 10 parking places for people driving electric cars and you don't like it, ever had that happen? That's not going, that's not going to stop the floods and the storms and the hail. Jesus said the, the storms were coming. The floods are coming. The enemy is coming. But the end is not yet. Because I'm coming and I'm bringing the end. Jesus said, listen to me. When they come for me, it's because I planned for them to come for me. When they take me out to the cross, it's because I planned on going to the cross. It's not going downhill anymore. It's going uphill. Doesn't look good to see a man of God under bondage. Doesn't look good to see a man of God arrested. Doesn't look good to see a man of God put on the cross of death. Especially when you believe he's God. I don't know if you would really enjoy watching God die. They don't give us a lot of information as to what people were thinking. What was Mary thinking? Is this going along with what Gabriel said? It doesn't seem to be right. But, but, but maybe, maybe she didn't have some understanding because it said she kept things in her heart and pondered it before the Lord. The apostles were having trouble with it. We, we, a couple, not, not, not the twelve, but a couple of God's followers said we had thought that he was going to be the one that would deliver Israel. Well, well that's the Emmaus disciples, remember them? They told that to Jesus. They didn't know who he was. See how wrong they were? Because he died. Well, he's not dead. He's walking with you. He's walking with you. He's not dead. But we had thought he is going to be the one to deliver Israel, but not that way, that day. That, 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 that's not the, the way it's going to happen. There's more delivery. This is just the beginning of God's deliverance, see? So that's what Daniel tried to explain. And Daniel, Daniel didn't have the opportunity. As much as he knew, you say, boy, I sure would like to be like Daniel. No, you wouldn't. Nothing against him, but you know so much more than he knows. Daniel didn't have the story that I just told you about Jesus and Mary and John and the Emmaus disciples. He didn't hear what the Apostle Paul said. See what I'm saying? Well, where we're supposed to be. We've got more knowledge than many people have ever had. And we better get busy doing something with it. Everybody that's not, not serving God, not reading their Bible, not praying, not getting into the, with the people of God and fellowship and teaching. And they better get with the program because we've got a lot of information God's given with us and we've got to get it out. And God, you, you, you saw that last week. God gave me a message while that offertory was going on. He said, there's something coming. I'm going to use you people. I've had to be reminded of that several times. God tapped me on the shoulder and said, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing? You forget what I said? It's coming. There's an opportunity. You know, you mean people, you're going to tarry in people. You know, I didn't say anything about anybody but you guys. The people that, that hear this message. There's something coming. God's ready. And, and somebody said, well, it doesn't seem like it. We, well, we, okay, it doesn't seem like it. We had thought that it was he who was going to deliver Israel. We, we had thought we could get the Jesus on the, on the water, Peter said. See, it's not what you think. It's not your interpretation. It's what the Lord says. I am the Lord. God speaks the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we celebrate Jesus with this communion. Aren't you glad? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words from the book of Daniel and other parts of the Bible that we've been studying talking about in this message there at other times, Lord. We thank you. We pray that as we go into communion and we partake of these elements that represent your life on the cross, we will realize afresh and anew today what you have for us, what you're going to give to us, how you're going to use us in the same way that you used Daniel and these other friends of his to do your work then and you're going to use us to do your work today. We thank you for that. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name.
about your life, I don't know what particular stage we would pick. 10 years old, 18 years old, 40. How long would you like to be here? Think about that for a moment. A long time ago for most of us. Most of us are way past that age. So if the Lord said, how long would you like to be here? What would you have said? Think about it. What do you know? It didn't make much of an impression on me for a long time. And then when I passed that number of years and then it moved to our knowledge more than twice those years, I am particularly impressed with the fact that Jesus planned to be here just 33 years. That's a mighty short time, isn't it? And, and it wasn't even 33 years of ministry. He only had three years. Is it possible that he couldn't see any reason to be here any longer than he had to be because this isn't all that good? Now, now if that's the wrong interpretation, I want God to forgive me. Because God has created a life and it's a good thing, and that even though there are the problems, and God wants us to enjoy life if we go in the right way, but still, we're supposed to realize that things are better out of here. This is just a temporary situation. And the Bible says, from the beginning to the end, they no doubt about it, have no doubt about this it. it's better. The other is better. You might not believe that, you might not feel like it, you might not want that. The doctor said you got three months to live or six months to you might say, oh no. If the apostle Paul said I have a desire to depart, which is far better. So anyway, God's in charge of your times. Your times are in his hands, the Bible says. Some of you have lived a lot longer than 33 years, amen. <laughs> Think about Jesus. We've got we've got children older than that. Some of us have great children older than that. Simon, Peter, and James, and John, they were probably, according to what we know, they were shooting for 70, 80 years at that time. And the odds of reaching that were a lot, a lot less than they are now. But they, oh geez, not now, don't leave now. Don't, especially now when we're here, and Jesus said, don't worry about it. I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to forsake you. But I've got to go. Greater love has no man than that he laid down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus said he was going to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for going to this life, for going into ministry. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. Thank you for going to the grave. Thank you for coming forth from the grave and entering into the other side of eternity where you have always existed and where we will go to exist. We don't understand the way life begins so much. And then we act like we don't understand the way that it ends so much. And maybe the problem is Lord, because it doesn't end. But it continues on. And the decision is how are we going to continue it? So we choose to continue by depending on He who gave His life for us we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Partake of this, ladies and gentlemen, that represents the body of Jesus. of the dream 
Daniel said, and this is what we've been talking about in, in, in giving all this credit to Jesus. God, the God of heaven, say goodbye to Babylon, say goodbye to Persia, say goodbye to Greece, say goodbye to Rome, say goodbye to Great Britain, say goodbye to France, say goodbye to America, say everybody, let the nations go. But, but God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And it will not be left to these other invaders and marauders. But it shall break in pieces and consume all those kingdoms. All the kingdoms of the world have not gone yet, but they will be taken away. And God's kingdom will stand forever, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar. Amen. God's kingdom shall stand forever. They said one of the reasons, people say, you know, the Vikings seem to be quite successful. They said one of the reasons why is whenever they would land in a particular place to conquer it, the commander would, would uh, give orders to burn their boats so they, they weren't going to be able to leave. They had to take over and get in possession if they even want to go into boat loading business and build boats to go back home. That's not jumping out of the boat, that's burning the boats. Burn the bridges behind you, folks. We're not talking about violence, we're talking about just get rid of the past. We're going forward. Don't you feel a little bit like Joshua today? We are well able. We are well able. We are well able to take this land because God's given it to us. It shall stand forever. You saw the stone Nebuchadnezzar cut out of the mountain without hands. And listen, it broke in pieces. That's the Lord's revelation in the Messiah. It broke in pieces the iron and the brass and the clay and the silver and the gold. And God's going to set up a kingdom. Amen. Let's all stand together. If you have a missions offering for us, we'll receive that at this time. It, according to our tradition, if you've already given, God bless you. It's okay. And this song says what Daniel's interpretation was. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Not be moved, but will endure forever. That's the kingdom of God. Give me say amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.